Hey, this is Dr. Ben White, host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Our topic for today is Parkinson's disease with Dr. Karen Duncan, and this is the first time we've covered Parkinson's disease. Dr. Karen Duncan is a board-certified naturopathic physician with a focus on integrative neurology. Dr. Duncan is a specialist in treating patients with Parkinson's disease using an integrative functional medicine approach. Dr. Dale Bredesen has blazed a trail in developing a functional medicine approach to the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's disease, but there are not many in the functional medicine world who have a specialty of treating patients with Parkinson's disease, which is the second most common chronic neurological disease after Alzheimer's. Fortunately, there is quite a bit of literature looking at the potential benefits of specific nutritional and lifestyle approaches to helping patients with Parkinson's disease, as Dr. Duncan helped me to discover when I asked her to send me some references, and she was very kind to send me more than 20 papers to read. And of course, being the science geek I am, I read most of them. So Dr. Duncan, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Hey, you're already doing better than me. I don't know if I've read all of them. <laughs> Um, so, you know, before we get started, I just found out yesterday that there's this uh, big scandal about the research related to Alzheimer's disease. This researcher investigator um, did this careful analysis of the um, Hallmark study that really seemed to have proven the hypothesis that um, that beta amyloid aggregation in the brain was the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And this was referenced in thousands of other studies as the basis for all these drugs which haven't worked. Um, and it's, it's really uh, a major scandal in the Alzheimer's world. That, that really caught me off guard, you know, when I, when I heard about that and thank you for sharing that information. And, it, you know, it's an incredible, you know, jumping off point to our conversation today, just about, about research, really, what is research and what does that mean for our patients? And I think, you know, you sharing that with me, the very first thing that hits me, especially in this profession is just overwhelming sense of grief, right? For the patients and the caregivers and these people who invested time and energy and their healing potentials into these therapeutics that were founded on a scandal. And I think that's really, really unfortunate you know, for the whole profession too. So um, disappointing to say the least, uh, you know, but really the biggest question, you know, that I like to ask, cause I'm curious nerd science geek too, is how do we know what we know? Right. right. And my mentor used the example of scurvy. She says, Hey, scurvy was around for 300 years before we learned that the vitamin C in limes was the biochemical feature that was treating this disease of vitamin C deficiency in our sailors. But for 300 years, we were able to treat and save lives with Lyme's. Parkinson's disease has been around for about 300 years. We still have no disease modifiable medications on the market. And what the conventional researchers want us to prove is why does this work? And really what we want to ask is what works? <laughs> what's, right. what's working out there and not causing harm? And then how can we kind of figure out what's in the line, right? So to speak, how do, right. how do we do that? Because meanwhile, these are humans, these are patients, these are, you know, our people with Parkinson's and their families who are, who are going through this. Um, you and, know, and, and, we also, and we also have uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen's work, who's shown for the first time that Alzheimer's disease can actually be not just slowed down, but reversed using a full functional medicine approach. And none of the medications for Alzheimer's disease has ever been effective at doing anything other than possibly slowing the progression. And yet we have a functional medicine approach that can reverse it. Um, but of course, this is falling on silent ears in the um, conventional medical world. And yeah, so I mean, we're trying to yell louder, right? And I think the big <laughs> 
delineation there is it is it slowing progression and that's with parkinson's disease are we slowing progression or are we are we masking symptoms and of course symptom palliation is really important we we want to improve quality of life with that medication and that's you know levodopa that's oh i love it prescribe it i'm on it but what are right. we doing to slow progression and like you started at the beginning we actually have the data that conventional research wants to see with these nutraceuticals, with food choices, with exercise, with lifestyle, um, that is showing slowing of progression of the disease. So as that marches on, when we're palliating symptoms, we're actually doing interventions that can that can actually slow the progression. Uh, so let's start right there, and perhaps you could define for the listeners what is Parkinson's disease, and then how is it best diagnosed. Well, I mean, the very Parkinson's disease is a is a motor uh, degeneration, neurodegenerative disease of motor dysfunction um, accumulation, right? I mean, now we're going to start asking questions. You've already put that <laughs> down my ear, but um, the accumulation of alpha synuclein in the basal ganglia there in the brain, which is our is our motor uh, nucleus. So it, it's usually classified by you know the hallmark symptoms of bradykinesia or slow movement, stooped posture, masked face, and a tremor. And that tremor has really taken the you know the load of diagnostic criteria uh, to get to Parkinson's disease. The truth is, Ben, we're we're ten to twenty years late on diagnosis. Uh, Parkinson's disease is starting decades before patients show up with a tremor. And by the time they're diagnosed, the 80% of their dopaminergic neurons are deplete. So we, we're just late to the game in diagnosis in, in specific. So when you ask, what is Parkinson's disease? And I, you know, stutter. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't really know yet. You know, right. we, we know what we've been told and we know what we're seeing 20 years after um, it begins, but we're still not sure, you know, what causes it. And the theories out there for Parkinson's, oxidative stress, is an environmental exposure, genetics, mitochondrial dysfunction, gut dysbiosis. You know, we'll go into some of these, and the answer is yes, right. yes, yes, yes. And also we're seeing right. all of these as being correlative. So, and, um, and of course, you just mentioned the dopaminergic uh, neurons. So um, maybe you could explain what happens there. So part of the process is is that the person with Parkinson's is unable to produce. Uh, sufficient quantities of dopamine, correct? Right. Yep. And, and that's exactly it. These dopaminergic neurons that are highly concentrated in that basal ganglia, as they die and they release their toxins and their cell debris, it creates oxidative stress for their surrounding neurons. And therefore we have this accumulation of, of neuronal death and inability to, to create dopamine, which then will create at some threshold, again, unbeknownst to us, will start to create these motor symptoms that then lead patients to seek care. And, and what you're saying about the fact that this long gradual onset of disease and by the time these uh, symptoms are help us to diagnose this condition, it's been going on for decades, is very common for the majority of autoimmune diseases, right? Of which I think Parkinson's is believed to be one, right? There's, there's definitely theories out there that this is a type of autoimmune disease, you know, that's similar to Alzheimer's disease. Is this a type three diabetes? There's so many, yeah, different system implications, but yeah, a ton of research right. on the autoimmune part. Yeah. So these chronic diseases are slowly developing for long periods of time. And we should really be focused on trying to see some of the underlying triggers and, and, and other factors that are slowly causing our, our brain not to function properly or to lead to brain uh, neural inflammation and try to identify some of those and intervene rather than waiting until the person is in, has already severe damage to their central nervous system. Yeah, you nailed it, Ben. I mean, if I were to ask you, what are the top three risk factors for heart disease? Right? Anybody in the medical profession can list them off, rattle them off, right? right. We're looking at smoke, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, family history, right? We've got those. Right. And you see this combination of symptoms in your office and you're like, whoa, let's get going. Let's prevent, you know, it doesn't matter what modality you practice. What if I were to tell you that the largest percentage of patients that are diagnosed with Parkinson's had 10 to 20 years of anosmia or lack of sense of smell, REM sleep disorder, and constipation. Right. Now you see those in your, in your clinical practice as a patient who's showing up in these ways. Can we respond in the same way and say, hey, do we know for a fact you're going to get Parkinson's? No. 
but can we do something right now to right. say that you won't? <laughs> so let's 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 shine a little light on what you just said. So those three are early prodromal symptoms, and um, can a person have one or two of those, or do you, is it more likely that they have all three of those um, and and are more likely to develop Parkinson's? You know, honestly, I don't think there's data that will show what percentage of people okay. with Parkinson's okay. have one, two, or three of okay. these motor symptoms. Okay, and but when we you're have looking at lack of sense of smell, constipation, and um, um, let's see, REM sleep you, disorder. And REM sleep, yeah, problems. Yeah. So the, the majority of people with Parkinson's will present with all three of those, if not, like I said, one or two. I guess my point is, if somebody shows up to your office at 40 years old right. with this trauma, can you respond as quickly as you would with the risk factors for heart disease? Right. Are Absolutely not. No. No, no. I mean, we're giving Miralax and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, in all actuality, I mean, these, these people are, you know, getting treated for those things. And I think this recognition of what does this mean and what could this show us? And, and we get this data again because we're doing these patient reported outcome measures, these studies that say, hey, I'm going to survey this population of patient, uh, Parkinson's, which you've already mentioned, is vast and say, hey, what do you got going on? What did right. you have going on? What, what's leading up to your disease and what's what's making this hard for you? And when we look at pre-mortar or non-mortar symptoms, I mean, the list is a mile long. And I want to get into that. You know, that's really, I think, the meat of what we're doing here. But addressing that tremor, I had mentioned it before, has taken the cake as far as measurement of success in treatment of Parkinson's disease. You know, you know, my patients will come in and they'll say, hey, I went to my primary neurologist. I said, great, what did you cover? You know, I did the chicken dance, the UPDRS score, you know, how well can my fingers move? I said, awesome, how'd you score? They're like, I don't give a shit. Here's what's bothering me. You know, I have anxiety. I still haven't pooped in three days. My, you know, I'm drooling in public. I have, I wake up to pee four times a night and oh, by the way, I'm dizzy when I stand up. So my risk of falling is greater. I mean, you dive into these conversations and this tremor is a hallmark of diagnosis of Parkinson's. It, it really just needs to, to step aside. Okay. So, um, how is there a definitive way to diagnose Parkinson's or is it mainly by symptoms? It's, it's mainly by clinical presentation. Yep. You're yeah. going to see that we have a DAT scan out there. So there's imaging of the brain that can, well, I treat it kind of as it can confirm a positive suspicion of diagnosis, but it won't always not confirm, you know, that it's not there. So the po false positives and negatives there are, are high. Um, working with a lot of the movement disorder specialists in the area, um, I'm really well integrated with the conventional side here and they, they don't rely on it heavily for, for diagnostic criteria. So it really is constellation of symptoms, patient presentation and, um, you know, and physical exam can't be minimized. Can we actually get in there and see is there cogwheel rigidity? What does the tremor look like? Are we checking, you know, DTRs? Because these things help us support what else is happening in the body, not just Parkinson's. So give, give us some uh, things that we can look for on a physical exam that would really alert you that this may be a patient with Parkinson's. I mean, you're looking for tremor, drooling, right? The, the outward bradykinesia, you're going to do your gait analysis and posture. Um, what I want to say is when we're looking for these things on surface level, can you dive three steps deeper, right? A lot of times, yeah, there's maybe gait abnormalities. Are you asking, was there injury, surgeries? You know, what else is happening there? Are you checking leg length discrepancies on physical exam? Um, when you're doing your range of motion tests, are you doing active and passive? Are you doing resisted? Again, injuries, surgeries. So I think I think we're quick to the diagnosis of Parkinsonism, if I can say that, you know, to be so bold, um, because I think there's all these things that we're trained in medical school to ask, and then there's layers underneath. You know, most of the patients who are presenting, they're 70 years old. That's a lot of life lived, and um, while it might appear to be Parkinson's disease you know, really ensuring that you're familiar with the human body and how it moves in their personal history is, is important. Um, so yeah, the gait analysis, the lack of arm swing, um, and then uh, so much of the physical exam then is going to be, you know, the, the interview, you know, what are your non-motor symptoms? There's, there's widely published questionnaires out there, NMS questionnaires for PD. Um, I highly recommend all clinical practitioners to at least do one 
uh, well, which that. which you consider the the most accurate questionnaires, and I, I've seen some discussion in the literature about questionnaires that are filled out by the patient and questionnaires that are filled out by the practitioner. What do you think is the most effective questionnaire or questionnaires? The one that you do, <laughs> the one that you the one that you ask. <laughs> um, again, I just, I'm seeing so few, you know, actually being completed, okay. but you know, I, one, it's a very, I don't know, PD NMS question. I'd have to give you the, the resource. I don't know. I don't have it sitting in front of me, right. um, but you know, asks very specific questions. Are these non-motor symptoms that you're having on a scale of one to four? How frequent are you having them? And then how much are they impacting your quality of life? So again, a three-tiered questionnaire. Now, another one that we're using in our research and that I use in my clinical practice is called the PROPD, and it stands for Patient Reported Outcomes in Parkinson's Disease. And this is something that I have my patients fill out every six months under my care. And it's a patient filled out subjective survey, and it's a slider bar, which I really like instead of the zero to 10, because people want to say four and a half, right? And you're like, <laughs> I don't have that button. Right. Um, and they fill this out. And why I think that's beneficial is you can see it on interview. They come in in December, there's four feet of snow on the ground. They're cold, they're depressed. It, you know, it's COVID, we're isolated. And I say, how do you feel? I feel terrible. And you look at their pro PD and it's actually kind of decent, right? And then six months prior in June, they're in and it's sunny and they're going for walks and their pro PD is, is much worse. So it does hold that a little bit accountable um, for that objective and subjective uh, asking of questions. But the, you know, the main point here is you can't look at somebody and know how they're doing. Um, one of the most poignant things one of my patients actually told me is, you keep asking me about my anxiety. And he goes, I don't think it's anxiety in the typical definition of anxiety. What you see on the outside, this tremor is what I feel on the inside. It's just discomfort, but the only way I can express it is through anxiety. So really getting to know what this feels like for people. Right. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but I'd like to take a minute to tell you about a new product that I'm very excited about. I'd like to tell you about a new wearable called the Apollo. And this is a device that can be worn on the wrist or the ankle, and it uses vibrations to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And this device has amazing benefits in terms of uh, getting you out of that stressed out sympathetic nervous system and stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. It has a number of different functions, especially helping you to relax, to focus, to concentrate, to get into a deeper meditative state, even to help you sleep. And there's even a mode to help you wake up. And this all occurs through the uh, scientific use of subtle vibrations. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in getting the Apollo for yourself to help you uh, reset your nervous system, go to apolloneuro.com and use the um, affiliate code WHITES10. That's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z-10. And now back to the discussion. So uh, let's just mention the most common pharmaceutical approaches to Parkinson's and why this approach is problematic, which is typically to take a combination of levodopa and carbidopa. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that is really the gold standard in the first um, line therapy for Parkinson's disease. And to be quite honest, Ben, I support it. I think, you know, there's the, the, again, kind of liking it to type one diabetes, right? Somebody who can't make the hormone that improves their quality of right. life and physiological being, we need to supplement that. So um, levodopa and carbidopa help the brain to make dopamine, correct? Not necessarily. They're just giving the body that dopamine that the body is missing. So that's why it's a palliative medicine. Okay. Is we can't make the dopamine, we're going to give you the dopamine. Okay. Now where it's really helpful, the carbidopa, and this again, I don't see, you know, really out there in the education that much. And, and I, I was like the metaphor of a car. Carbidopa is the car. It's the shuttle bus. We have levodopa receptors throughout our entire periphery, but that carbidopa really holds on to levodopa until it gets to that blood brain barrier and then releases it. So it's a higher concentration of efficacy in the brain. So on that note, why I always prefer the synthetic medications of, you know, Cinemet or Ritari for my patients is because it's really hard to standardize, you know, something like Macuna Purians, which is okay. the natural source of levodopa. It's highly right. concentrated, and potent, 
but that potency can vary from capsule to capsule, manufacturer to manufacturer, um, bottle to bottle within manufacturer. So we're still working on really getting a standardized process there. And then we're lacking the carbidopa part of that. So uh, I'll tell patients, hey, if you want to take Makuna, that's great. Drink it with your green tea. And they come back two weeks later. I can't drink any more green tea. You know, it's just it's a lot of green tea. So when we're looking for standardization and what dose is required, you know, I, I'm definitely on the, hey, let's get some, let's get you some levodopa. Let's improve that quality of life um, for you by symptom palliation. But with the explanation, we are not slowing the progression of the disease by doing this. Right. And then one of the problems with, uh, with these drugs is that after a while, they stop working as well. Isn't that correct? That's a really popular theory that we continue to challenge. And in my clinical practice, so when I first started, I was like, I challenge this, you know, like I didn't have, <laughs> like, I, I challenge this. Um, being further into clinical practice, Ben, I'm sitting there like, I challenge this. And so many patients will come in and say, I just got diagnosed, but my, my doc said not to start right away because I'm going to wear off in 10 years. And we start to get into, you know, further workup and investigation. How's your thyroid? How's how's your gut function? Let's, let's just dive into gut function, Ben. Like if somebody's constipated and they're having one to two bowel movements a week, do you think their medications are going to be effective? Of course it, not. It just, right. It's an, it's enhancing your absorption capability, your bioavailability, your absorption rate, metabolism, all of these different aspects. So what do we do? We go to the doc. Hey, I'm not seeing the relief I want. Well, let's add some more. Let's add some more. Let's add some more five to 10 years in. Oh, you hit your max dose. Sorry. We got to do something else. Well, what if we got people pooping? What if we detox the system? What if we reduced environmental exposures? What if we started really working with how the whole body's physiology is optimal? And then we see these medications drop off. And why I'm able now to stand on the rooftop and say, I challenge that concept is because for most of my patients, we've been able to decrease their dose of carbidopa, levodopa and reduce medications by 30 to 50% within a year. Interesting. I, I, I was wondering what you were going to say about this question. I was thinking that maybe you were going to say, let's do all the functional medicine stuff first and then only throw in the medication later. But you're saying if, if they get on the medication, which is going to help them with some of their symptoms right away, and we do all the functional medicine stuff, then that medication won't have the drop-off effect that it does in a conventional approach. That's exactly it. It's, you know, it's the top down, bottom up approach. Um, and, and let's not forget the mental, emotional side effects of Parkinson's disease. I mean, apathy being the top one. So here we are on your prescription pad, conventional doc. I am so proud of myself. I'm prescribing exercise, right? Well, that patient <laughs> emotionally to get up and to go exercise and to want to do these things. This is an aspect of neurologic health. And so when you're speaking to a patient and their care provider, and the care providers in there, I can't possibly, you know, pulling out the hair, try to motivate him to go out and go to the gym anymore. I'm losing my mind. This is so hard. And so why would we expect somebody to be able to go do lifestyle changes if they feel terrible, if they're apathetic? So yes, giving this levodopa, giving this synthetic medication um, to supplement that loss at the very beginning is really what I think promotes the healing process. And, and like I said before, 80% of your dopaminergic neurons are gone. So if we can get the benefit of supplemental levodopa for the rest of your life, I'm in. And then, okay, now we're enhancing those, those other, you know, potential side effects of apathy and depression and anxiety. So then they're more apt to go out and exercise and build up their vitality and health and, and really slow the disease down. So let's go through some of the most common environmental triggers that you found uh, tend to play a role in patients with Parkinson's. You just mentioned gut health. Let's talk about some of the gut health factors and things that you often see in patients with Parkinson's. Yeah. How much time do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. But... Um, I'm going to tell you something by nature. I'm one of those devil's advocate people. I drive everyone nuts. Right. So I sat through all of school and said, I will not be that doc that says it all happens in your gut, right? I just, the flow of the tide, you go through naturopathic medical school, you're learning functional medicine, you're doing all these things and it's, it's in the guts and the guts and the gut. And I'm just like, I challenge this again. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm not real loud because I'm still in school. But I'm like, I'm not going to be that doc. Lo and behold, here I am that doc being like, how's your gut? What's happening in there? Let's, let's take a peek. Um, and I would, you know, 
if I throw it a guess in my patient population, 90% of people with Parkinson's that I'm seeing have gut dysfunction, okay. um, either small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. We've got dysbiosis. I mean, one of the hallmark non-motor symptoms is constipation. And I'm not talking your run-of-the-mill constipation. I need to go take a laxative once in a while. I'm talking patients coming into my office, doubled over in pain, saying, I couldn't sit down and watch a movie with my family yesterday because it hurts so bad. I haven't had a bowel movement. So this type of gut dysfunction and dysmotility, you know, we really need to address this in a, in a again, holistic approach. Of course, that's what I do. So it's the word that comes to mind. So what are, um, what are some of the most effective ways you've helped patients uh, with Parkinson's, with constipation and some of these gut disorders, dysbiosis? I'm going to say the very first thing is one, normalizing it for them, letting them know they're not alone in this. And two, right. letting them know this contributing symptom to their disease severity. Um, again, so many people come into my office and they're scared and they're grieving and they're pessimistic, right? And it's, I don't place blame anywhere other than maybe higher up on the insurance realm, but they've been told, hey, you have a neurologic, you know, neurodegenerative disease. Here's your medication. I'll see you in six months. And that's, that's scary. And you see, you know, I have disease and here's what I'm going to go Google. And that, so they come in here feeling very fearful and what are they doing? And so what I like to say is this is a, this is a package deal. There's so many aspects to this. Let's teach you about what happens when you're constipated in your gut. If the goal of pooping is to literally get rid of toxic sludge in your body and you're not pooping, what's happening in your body? And they go, Oh, you can see the light bulbs come on, you know, I'm reabsorbing those toxins and here's what's happening in my bloodstream. And so you just, you know, really trying to say, this is our goal. This is what we want to do. And you can see them relax and, you know, really start to understand and become in tune with their body. So the education piece is huge. The second thing is there's, there's population studies out there that show people with Parkinson's have a decreased sense of thirst. Now, whether it's a decreased sense of thirst or they just don't want to drink because they're so sick of peeing every five minutes and then they have to stand up to go pee and their orthostasis when they stand up. And then, you know, there's this whole conglomerate of things that we have to think about. But if you're not drinking water, Ben, you're not pooping. Like we know this to right. be true. So I have these in-depth conversations with people every time they walk in my office about water and electrolytes and, you know, how, what, what, how do we move poop? What, what is pooping, right? How do, <laughs> so, you know, we talk a lot about poop, but the, the important thing is, is that people start to understand their bodies. And when there's understanding, then we shift into that parasympathetic nervous system and we can come out of that fear, that fight or flight. And oh, lo and behold, that's vagal nerve function. And now we're having better gut motility and better digestive enzymes. And we're teaching people how to masticate and how to swallow because now there's trouble swallowing and enhancing absorption by different nutraceuticals. I mean, I have a whole six week protocol and it's called the gut overhaul. How do we remove triggers, decreased inflammation, increased gut motility, you know, increased absorption. And at the end of six weeks, people are coming in and like, I never thought this was possible. And you're talking about people who've had a disease for 20 years. Right. And now they're, they're pooping for the first time. And oftentimes constipation goes back to childhood. So right. I get a lot of hugs about poop and I think it's full circle karma for my attitude in med school saying I'm not gonna <laughs> blame everything here on the gut, but. Right, good. So um, I, I know heavy metals can play a role and I've even seen a, a couple of papers about manganese, which I guess you can have a excess amount of manganese that creates a Parkinson's-like syndrome and um mm -hmm. it's just so interesting how some of these heavy metals like manganese which are absolutely crucial for health you can have deficiencies and that creates problems but too much is a problem too yeah manganese associated parkinsonism is really commonly known within the profession and we'll run a heavy metal screen i usually do it on hair it's the least invasive and it's a pretty easy one to comply with uh, to get a start there and oftentimes, you know, if we do see manganism, so I'll say in my clinical practice or in my professional career, I've seen three total patients, which is a pretty big end comparatively to, to how many I've seen that were misdiagnosed with IPD. So idiopathic Parkinson's disease that we got to switch that over to Parkinsonism, do a detox protocol and watch their health improve by a significant amount. Yay, victory. That's, that's wonderful. Great. Manganism is, is definitely, like I said, it's, it's really well known. And what we're seeing a lot of is manganese is actually, like you, you alluded to, it's actually an essential element. So it's not even so much a heavy metal toxicity. We're looking for aluminum and uranium and different heavy metals in the body. But manganese, we actually see deficiencies of. So I get a little bit of like cross-eyed stares when I prescribe manganese as a supplement. 
Um, we manage that carefully, of course, not to go in excess, but as you alluded to, you know, manganese deficiency creates its own set of problems. So um, what are some patients. of the most common heavy metals that you'll see uh, involved with Parkinson's? Uh, heavy metal, mercury and lead. I mean, mercury those are kind lead. of your top yeah. three with neurologic conditions, you know, so it's, those are really common, especially when we're talking about the generation that's most prevalent to have the condition, right? How they were growing up, um, what they were exposed to, what we didn't know um, back then that, you know, accumulates in the body. And we know, you know, postmenopausal women, we usually will diagnose Parkinson's disease earlier in men, and then usually not tell postmenopause with women. And there's a couple different, you know, theories out there with that. Um, but one of them that I look at the most um, when we're talking about heavy metals is that's when the, the process of osteoporosis starts to come in, right? We're, we're right. losing our estrogen and our supportive uh, mechanism. So for these our metals are stored in the bones. And then when the bones start breaking down, they release the heavy metals. Exactly. Yep. So now we have an increased toxic burden and, you know, whether it's creating Parkinson's or exacerbating Parkinson's, it's still a question that needs to be answered. Um, along those same lines, heavy metals and toxins are stored in our adipose tissue. And what, again, one of the metabolic side effects of Parkinson's disease or movement disorder is increased weight loss. So now we have this osteoporosis, you know, happening and we have this weight loss happening where we're breaking down fat and we're just increasing this toxic burden to our body. And I guess chronic viral infections like HSV and EBV can be factors. They, I mean, they absolutely can be factors. And, you know, when we're starting to really tap into this greater theory of, um, I'm a big metaphor person, you know, and like I said, is your Parkinson's disease a suitcase that you're lugging around, right? Is everything that you have in your body associated with Parkinson's disease? Or can we look at you, you know, from 20,000 feet up and say, oh, you have a little thyroid dysfunction, you have this toxic metal burden, oh, you have this, you know, chronic viral infection in there, and you've got dysbiosis. And now when we start treating these things peripherally, that we are so quick to say, ah, that's just a symptom of Parkinson's disease, it makes that load a lot lighter. And I say, can we take Parkinson's disease as a diagnosis and throw it on like a backpack and go about with your day instead of lugging right. that thing around? Yeah. Um, so I what you're really getting at here is, is that concept. All of these things that we associate with the disease, yeah, they're there. But again, our patients are 70 years old for right. the most part. You know, got some a young onset Parkinson's disease, of course, but they've accumulated some health crises. You know, they've done it, they've lived. <laughs> so right. of course there's gonna be things in addition to that, that we're just really quick to say, oh, that's Parkinson's, you gotta live with this. And um, again, the, the quality of life and that patient-centered care, staying in your focus just has to be that primary goal. So you mentioned hormonal imbalances. I know that Dr. Brett is in uh, often uh, with uh, patients uh, with, um, say, um, women postmenopausal, um, even though they perhaps are in their 70s already, uh, will sometimes put the patients on um, estrogen replacement. Um, what do you think about um, hormone replacement therapy as part of the treatment protocol? What I mean, I feel like everything that I'm saying to you starts with it depends, but it, you know, it really does. No, um, I know, of course, it depends. Yeah. And there's, you know, it's a complicated factor and there's risk factors, et cetera. It's really, really helpful. It's a really helpful tool as long as, you know, you're screening the risk factors and you're doing all these things. But you know, there's there's a boatload of data on DHEA as neuroprotective, right? I, I saw and a couple of papers, yeah. And we label DHEA. I mean, who doesn't want this? The spunk and vitality hormone, right? Like, right. I want some. I'm raising a toddler here. I'm sipping on coffee. Like, <laughs> I want some spunk and vitality. So, you know, when we're looking at DHEA levels, we're looking try try to get them above 100. Um, and those, you know, those will fall postmenopausally. So there's, like I said, there's a ton of data and research out there about these specific hormones and the, and the protective mechanisms they have on the brain. Now, the one thing that I want to bring up again, as that person who said, I wouldn't always talk about poop is hormonal imbalances are often secondary to gut dysbiosis and inflammation, right? So making sure also that you're covering that liver, um, that I hate, do you have cholesterol? I know you mentioned you're doing something this evening with, um, Dr. Yeah, a tribute. Uh, yeah, we have a YouTube tribute to Dr. Sinatra. 
Yeah, to Dr. Sinatra. So, I mean, when we look at cholesterol, again, you want to see some side eyes from my patient's cardiologist. Like you took them off what? And I'm like, yeah, we, we want cholesterol. We're packaging hormones. And, you know, these are things that we're starting to challenge the status quo a little bit here um, because it's also the padding in the brain, right? For neuronal connections. So all of those factors playing into, yes, hormone replacement therapy can be a safe and effective option for our patients and often um, vastly improves quality of life. Um, is it possible to have a purely natural approach to Parkinson's without pharmaceuticals? Have you had any patients who were successful in an approach like that? I have, yes. So there are some patients who are just really set on, you know, we have the whole conversation, informed consent, shared decision making, you know, but here's what I feel about levodopa. Um, and they manage, there are some patients out there, you know, exercise and diet and mindfulness um, and social connections are really managing their disease well. And again, that's why we want to shift this research paradigm and say, hey, you've had this condition for 10, 15, 20 years, and you're climbing mountains here in, in Seattle. What what are you doing? Give us your secret. And let's isolate those against, you know, different variables and things to see, can we, can we reproduce this? That's what research all is, right? Is it reproducible? Um, so yes, I mean, a short answer to, you, to your question is yes, I've absolutely seen pe patients live with and a very high quality of life, their Parkinson's with just a natural approach. Take, take the pharmaceutical and tacopone, you know, for, for example, um, it's a pharmaceutical that we give in conjunction with the carbidopa levodopa to help its effic effect efficacy over time, right? Hey, this makes it more effective. You'll see a greater benefit. We also see that with CDP choline. So acetylcholine, um, a, a natural supplementation nutraceutical, when dosed appropriately, we can see a 30% reduction in the need for medication in 30 days, Ben, in wow. a month of taking supplement. So if you're taking Macuna and you're taking some CDP choline and you're taking some fish oil, high DHA, and you're exercising and, you know, working on your vagal nerve function, I mean, you're, you're slowing the progression of disease at a very organic level without. So what dosage of CDP choline? We're looking at 250 milligrams and I'm going to double check. Was that 250 milligrams? I believe that's twice daily. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to go into the nutraceuticals, but before we do, um, I, I want to ask you another question that I'm sure your answer is going to be, it depends, but um, what is the best diet for uh, Parkinson's disease? I've seen people advocating the ketogenic diet, autoimmune paleo, avoiding dairy. What do you, what, what, let's talk about diet for Parkinson's. Let's talk about diet for Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> on this one you know this is uh is one of those factors that people get pretty upset about you know the overwhelming research and data that we have for diet for parkinson's is mediterranean mind whole food plant-based that those three kind of conglomerate that's what we're looking for um and really the constituent that we're looking for in those foods is the antioxidants right we're looking for those flavonoids and the the anthocyanins and the things that we're getting from these freshly you know, harvested fruits, vegetables, and, and things like that. Um, and then your healthy fats. So when you start breaking that down, and this is what I love about my mentor, and I have to give her a shout out at some point in time through this, because I'm really just downloading her brain into Who, my mouth. Who's, your, who's your mentor? That's Dr. Lori Mishley. Okay. So she's really heading the integrative research for Parkinson's disease globally. She speaks at World Parkinson's Congress. She's fun, funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation and NAH, and she's got a seat at the table anywhere she wants to go to really start bringing this to light. So um, I like to just use that, like I'm doing her brain in my mouth and, and here it comes. So okay. uh, it's fascinating, you know, smatterings of my clinical practice. Um, but, you know, she'll ask the tough questions. Is, is a whole foods diet effective because of the food? Or is it effective because now we have to go chop and prepare and cook and you're smelling your food and you're involved in the eating and, and there's this whole other like, integration and, and intimacy with your food when you're not just getting it, you know, frozen out of the freezer and, and heating it up in the microwave. So there's a component of that there, but the overwhelming data, Ben, is that, you know, this Mediterranean style diet is the most beneficial for Parkinson's disease. Now, well, we've I guess one of, one of the reasons why people advocate a ketogenic diet is because it's been shown to be beneficial, I believe, for, um, for Alzheimer's and because of the whole concept of, uh, 
uh, insulin resistance in the brain and, and, and having a higher fat, lower carb approach uh, and having the brain work off of ketones, uh, the, there is an argument that the brain works better that way. Yeah, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in that data as well. And when it comes to food, I'm definitely one of those practitioners. The best diet is the one that somebody's going to eat, that they're right. going to comply with, right? right? So if we, can, if we can move towards ketogenic through the Mediterranean diet, and that's supportive and working well for them, and it's in alignment with their quality of life, great. Um, right. However, I'm not seeing the like research really push it far enough over that I'm going right. to sit here and say this, this or bust, right. right? Okay. So I really want to take that into account. The second thing that I just want to bring out, and I'd always be remiss if I didn't, and just a quick snippet, we're talking about a population that's not often identified as having disordered eating habits, right? We reserve that for our 16-year-old athlete girls. And right. that's, that's a huge number. When you get into the conversation about how these individuals were raised, you know, from the World War II depression, parents and stoicism, and you eat what's on the table and here's how you look and here's how you act, you know, the very different mindset that we're in now. There's a lot of disordered eating habits that I'm seeing in my practice. So I just wanted to bring that to light a little bit too, to be really cautious when we're talking about food with our patients and really establishing what that, what that relationship is um, yeah. with them and food. Because that's a Again, we're talking vagal nerve dysfunction. If I prescribe a diet for you that's going to cause you stress and anxiety, screw that diet, right? right? <laughs> that's not what we're going here for. But really, yes. So to just kind of get back to the, the, the thick of it there, that Mediterranean mind, mind diet is what we're going for here. Um, some people do, you know, I've had people come in and say, I feel better on the carnivore diet. Okay, great. Let's check your metabolic markers and make sure that you're healthy. And this really, again, goes into the individualized care. Uh, we can prescribe diets, but we have to be considering insulin, other metabolic conditions, other, you know, thyroid conditions. And, you know, I have a patient who had esophageal cancer. Can you even digest animal proteins? Right. So right. now we're really, again, getting into that. It depends area, but the overwhelming right. research that we share is that, and we have the clinic and we have the data. I think I shared it with you. Like what foods all the way from frozen vegetables to canned vegetables to fresh vegetables, you know, what, what's better, <laughs> right. which, which do you, choose? so it's, it's there, it's available. And I guess uh, there's some data showing that dairy in particular uh, can be problematic as a trigger. Yeah. I usually put up my desk shield when I talk about that with patients and they're like, does that mean cheese? And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, and then they'll say, but what, but what about this? And, you know, the answer to that goes back to the, the initial conversations. There's not going to be a randomized control trial, you know, double blinded placebo controlled with goat cheese versus sheep cheese versus cow cheese, right? So you choose, but we have overwhelming data that not only people who consume cow's milk dairy have a higher incidence rate of developing Parkinson's disease, but also those who have already been diagnosed have faster progression rates. So that is one thing that I kind of put my foot in the sand and say, this is, you know, if you're going to do anything dietarily, do this, take this out. Right. Which forms of exercise are most beneficial? Um, I just wanted to add one more thing to dairy because it sure. helps when it's not taking away your food, right? We have found in the data that a higher uric acid level, so not gout levels, but above four in the bloodstream, it's actually a potent antioxidant for the central nervous system. So uric acid does have a purpose, right? So wait, these wait, wait a minute. So uric acid level above four, below four yeah. would be really low though, right? Right. Yep. And so like four to six, we're looking at to say, Hey, we don't want gout, but we want to keep this at a healthy level. Um, and that it is a potent antioxidant for the central nervous system. So again, here's something that we villainized. Oh my gosh, uric acid is bad, but there's right. a reason our body has uric acid, right? Like we, right. we have this, you know, sensical being to us that we still don't understand. That's and interesting. Cause you know, lately with Dr. Perlmutter and the drop acid is book, uh, there's been a big focus in the functional medicine world on trying to keep uric acid levels lower because it's, it's correlated with heart disease and other problems. Right. And I can't speak to heart disease, but what we know in the Parkinson's population is that actually a higher uric acid level is beneficial and the consumption of dairy inhibits uric acid production. Good. So we have that when people really come back with me about like, oh, I just don't know about dairy. I'm like, here's a biochemical rationale for you, you know, that shows what you can do. And then All if right. you've got a gout patient, 
on the side with no allergy to dairy, bring on the dairy, right? How do right. we naturally bring down those acid levels? Right. <laughs> I'd like to interrupt this fascinating discussion we're having for another few minutes to tell you about a, another really exciting product that has changed my life and the life of my family, especially as it pertains to getting good quality sleep. It's something called the Chili Pad, C-H-I-L-I-P-A-D. It can be found at the website, chilisleep.com, which is C-H-I-L-I-S-L-E-E-P.com. And so this product involves a water-cooled mattress pad that goes underneath your sheets and helps you maintain a constant temperature at night. If you've ever gotten woken up because the temperature has uh, changed, typically goes uh, gets warmer, um, this product will maintain your body at a very even temperature and it tends to promote uninterrupted quality um, deep and REM sleep, which is super important for healing and for overall health. And if you, um, if you go to chillysleep.com and you use the affiliate code WHITES20, that's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z, 20, you'll get 20% off a chili pad. So check it out and let's get back to this discussion. So uh, exercise, um, I saw a study on, um, I think you sent me a study on uh, cardiovascular aerobic exercises being beneficial. What forms of exercise do you find most beneficial? Um, the form that you don't know how to do. Something. <laughs> um, okay. Ballroom dancing. You know, ballroom dancing is one of my favorite ones to recommend. Number one, I'm a huge advocate for caregivers, support partners, you know, things like that. If you can find an activity that you can do together, it's using both sides of your brain and you're in this and you're so worried about stepping on your partner's foot that you forgot you had a tremor for a minute, right? That's the kind of neuroplasticity we're going here. How do okay. we, how do we support that, that neuroplasticity and growing new neuronal structures and, and learning how to do something new? Um, rock steady boxing is a phenomenal way to, you know, create community again, using both sides of your brain, um, being able to do some of that cognitive, you know, uh, support with that as well. Um, but really those things, you know, Tai Chi has been really hugely studied in the Parkinson's population as far as that slow controlled movement in conjunction with your breath. Um, so Cardiovascular exercise in general, yes, do it, but we do have some data. And I think it's just the ones that they've selected to research, right? So, right. you know, biking and, and, and boxing and, and things like that. Um, the one that you, so again, it's the one that you do and the one that's new. So pick something new and then actually right. go do it. Right. Now, where it's really fascinating is exercise is dose dependent. So when you have your prescription pad and you're like, look at me, I'm so proud of myself dabbling into this, you know, cam world, I'm going to prescribe exercise. How are you doing it? What exercise are you prescribing and how frequent should patients take it? Put it in your orange bottle and actually give it directions because we have studies that show if you exercise fewer than four days per week, it doesn't show any benefit at all. And then it's an increase in benefit based on how many more days you do it. So six is better than five is better than four. So it is dose dependent how often we're doing these exercise routines and, and how you're, what type you're doing. I, I wonder if there's been any data on strength training, because if you're trying to do new, novel, different exercise movements, then strength training is something that would certainly lend itself to uh, doing different exercises in different ways on different equipment. That would be a way to easily have a different movement uh, that you're bringing into your body on a regular basis. I agree. And the very first thought that comes to mind on strength training is fall prevention, right? right. Practicality. How do, we, how, do we, how do we, you know, keep our fall prevention? The second thing that comes to mind is just thinking of myself when I'm lifting a really heavy weight and what do you do? You grunt, and, oh, you know, you use a big voice. Right. We already know the LVS program works for this minimal, you know, voice and some of these side effects. So, I love it. I, you know, I think there's probably data out there somewhere that I'm not familiar with, but so really let, let's go into specific nutraceuticals uh, for patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, 
I, I would appreciate if you could be specific about dosages or even products that you like. Um, uh, the, the nutrient that I've talked to more doctors who feel that is the biggest game changer is uh, mm -hmm. intravenous glutathione. And yet I just saw a meta-analysis on glutathione that uh, seemed to show that there was not necessarily any great benefits. Yeah, so that, I mean that's a great place to start. You know, right off the bat, I do I practice individualized personalized medicine. I do pride myself on that, and I can also say every person with Parkinson's that walks through my door walks out with a prescription for three natural medicines, and it's, they're the most highly studied and researched to either help with symptom management or slow progression. Um, and that's glutathione, uh, high DHA fish oil, and CoQ10. Okay. And those have the data behind it to say it makes sense. And I'll go into each one. Uh, but to answer your question, IV glutathione, I mean, that research has been around since the 80s. I want to say maybe even the 70s when they first did that study, you know, you walk down the hall, you get your IV, and then we can watch you walk down the hall again. Um, again, it's a very elementary, like, hey, look at this guy walk better. Um, the, the benefits are limited with IV glutathione. So it's a high dose. It's, you know, pretty inter invasive. They have to go twice a week. Uh, to get the benefits of it, the long lasting benefit of it. And then it's an IV, you know, like I said, it's, it's a little bit of an invasive therapy. Right. The other thing, it's not accessible. It's expensive. This isn't something right. that insurance is covering right. right now. And the research that we have, it actually can show that either an intranasal application of glutathione or even an oral glutathione, and we do this through the buccal mucosa, has just as much benefit to our patients when they can take this on a daily basis uh, from right. their home. It's more cost effective and it's showing benefit. Um, Dr. Lori Mishley actually published a study. She got to phase two clinical trial, and I'll t tell you about why that kind of fizzled out after phase one. But, you know, the phase one was just overwhelming improvement in the UPDRS scores and handwriting, and, and this is well published out there on PubMed with the use of intranasal glutathione. So they moved it to phase two with the funding, and people were so excited to be part of this study and to get you know, using this, and this is your double-blinded, you know, randomized um, placebo-controlled study that the placebos did just as well as the glutathione, which all <laughs> moved up. Yay, placebo, right? There's so much more medicine than just what we're putting in our patients' bodies, but how we can get them excited for new therapies. And, um, you know, again, alluding to my grief for these poor Alzheimer's patients who bought into this theory that was a scam but we have that power as physicians to get people really excited and hopeful um, about their therapies but we are seeing benefit in especially in motor symptoms with the use of um, like i said oral or intranasal glutathione so um tell us about the oral glutathione what what is there a particular product or products that you like and is there a particular dosage uh that you tend to favor yeah, so I mean, I want to take this opportunity before we really dive into nutraceuticals, Ben, because this I never thought that this was going to be, you know, one of my testaments as a, as a practitioner, but because the supplement industry isn't regulated by the FDA, um, it makes it really challenging for patients to navigate these waters. And it's really frustrating as a healthcare provider to say, hey, that's, you know, that's not a quality assured product, but I know that you don't have access to maybe this or that. Um, so as often as you can, I just really advocate to, you know, share information, share resources, especially as our integrative care providers, get out and do community chalk talks, get out and do webinars and podcasts and say, this isn't a thing that's being done, but you can ask me questions. What are legit you know, uh, reputable sources for these supplements because they aren't benign. They aren't always safe. And just because your neighbor's cousin's brother's dog saw benefit doesn't mean <laughs> it's for you. So, and that's where we're really going in this healthcare field with so much research and, and resources on the internet um, and from your neighbor that it's really becoming harmful. And that's what I'm seeing patients unloading 30 to 50 supplements on my desk. No, look, hey, this is what I'm taking. And it's like, no, you know, I, I applaud your advocacy and, and, you know, resourcefulness, but here's what we need to do for your body on that line. Um, so for glutathione, uh, I, we use a couple different brands, you know, Quicksilver and Designs for Health have a really great oral liquid glutathione. I use the pump, it needs to stay refrigerated, and then it's absorbed through the buccal mucosa. Right. So I get a little bit of a bypass from the gut absorption dysfunction that we have. And um, how, how and many sprays do you like? Um, and then... Um, uh, how many times a day? 
I do that at two pumps twice a day away from food. Okay. Yep. And the, and the side effect of oral glutathione is it tastes like sulfur, which is not a fun taste. Um, it's sulfur-based, you know, uh, compound. Um, but I have learned that um, orange juice is a great chaser. So okay. we find those to help with compliance a bit. The interesting thing about that is most of the studies that Lori published were this intranasal application, right? Because we know we have a direct access to the brain through our nasal cavity. Right. Um, a little bit more challenging to do, not quite as cost effective. And what she did notice is that so much of it was draining down the throat anyway, that that's kind of where it was going. So again, there's a hierarchy of effectiveness of glutathione and you do what works for your patient. And I found that an oral glutathione supplement is the most effective because people can access it for long periods of time and are compliant. Okay. And then um, CoQ10, uh, I, I, I think I saw that you prefer MitoQ. Is that right? Or was that maybe in another article I read? Um, that might have I'm not sure which article is in. We okay. usually do an ubiquinol, right? An activated CoQ10. It's a little bit more uh, bioavailable. Um, so, as far as that, so, you, you know, we carry protocol for life here. There's a lot of really great, reputable okay. brands of CoQ10. Okay. I mean, even, even Costco carries a really good one. Um, so you're using so, ubiquinol and what dosage? And that can be anywhere from 100 to 300 milligrams. And this is a really subtle effect that I tell patients, you're not going to start taking this. And in a month, you're going to be like, "Woo, I can go run a marathon. But what we're doing there, as you're aware of, is we're supporting the mitochondrial health. And mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the theories that is, you know, causative for Parkinson's disease. But the big thing that I like to explain to patients in educational realm is if, if you have a movement disorder, and we know that the mitochondrial are really, you know, heavily populated in your heart, your brain, and your skeletal muscle, and you're moving at a rate much more than I am who can sit here still, then you're, you're utilizing a lot of that ATP. So we need to support this at a cellular level. Are you going to see this giant change? Not necessarily, but we are seeing in our population studies, right, that people who do supplement with CoQ10 have an improved quality of life. And then and you said you like a high DHA uh, fish oil? Yep, high DHA fish oil. And this, this part of the education comes in really important as well because one, DHA, the, the marketing, again, to go back to this you know, regulatory body that we don't have, you go look at the store and, and I challenge a lot of my patients, say, go to the store and look at the dosing or look at the labels on the front, you know, 3 million omega-3s, right? We're blasting all this on the front label and then you turn it around and it's from other sources and here's this and here's that. And when you really break it down to the EPA and DHA, we're, we're at very few. And then you got to look at serving size, right? right? Oh, you're getting 500 milligrams of omega-3s in four capsules. Well, now we've got somebody who has difficulty swallowing and taking these giant horse pills and they're getting a very minimal result. Right. So it is something that we as uh, integrative healthcare providers have to be really well educated on to say, hey, I know this bottle of liquid fish oil costs three times as much as that one you're going to get. Here's why it matters. You, right. know, you have a higher DNA potency here. You have a less, it's a teaspoon. You keep it refrigerated. You know, fish oil can go rancid, how it's stored. So that educational piece is really important. And we're, we're looking anywhere from two to four grams. So these aren't milligram dosing. These are really right. high dosing. So right. if, you're, if you're looking at somebody's fish oil supplement, I'll say, okay, go ahead and finish that bottle. And then don't ever buy that again. Cause you're going to finish it by tomorrow. You know, right. you're taking 12 capsules a day to right. get the dose. That you want. Yeah. So. I saw some, uh, Good data on vitamin D as being a factor. Oh yeah. Vitamin D and neurodegenerative diseases across the board, right? We have this Venn diagram of, you know, Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia and um, frontal lobe dementia and, and Parkinson's disease and all these things. And they all kind of mishmash and a lot of different symptom presentations and, and theories of etiology and all these other things there. And then the nutrients that really support it. And vitamin D as, you know, Dr. Bredesen has proven has been hugely, um, helpful in his, in his Alzheimer's protocol. So right. we definitely look at vitamin D status. I'm looking between eight, uh, 60 and 80 as a lab value. Okay. And what I like, to, I like to see your number be in the age decade that you're in. You're 75. Let's keep you in the seventies, you know, 68. Let's keep you in the sixties. Let's just keep it in that range. And people really resonate with that. That's great. Uh, um, I saw lithium as uh, being beneficial. Lithium is hugely beneficial. And and again, another side I write from the conventional, we know lithium is, is, a, is a medication for what, for what condition? Bipolar. 
bipolar, right? So when you're dosing lithium and you get these, these, you know, questions, lithium is an essential nutrient. It's a cofactor for tons of enzymatic, you know, reactions and biochemical reactions in the body. And the most crucial one is it's a cofactor for BDNF. It's brain derived neurotropic factor. It's how we grow new neurons. So we can't grow new neurons if we don't have lithium. Now, what there's been studies again since I want to say the 80s or 90s, and Dr. Lori has published some of those as well, lithium deficiency as well as other minerals in our soil becoming deplete. Um, people in the Pacific Northwest, it's just, you know, all of the rain and the washout and everything else, there's no lithium anymore. Um, and there was actually even a petition a while back to lithiumate the water, just like we fluorinate some water to say, we need this in our, in our body and the incidence of mental health concerns in the Pacific Northwest, right? So we're starting to see this correlation of lithium deficiency, mental health concerns. And then we know that this is a treatment protocol. When you're looking at lithium as the treatment protocol for bipolar, this is at a super physiologic dose. These are pharmacologic doses, right? That we're, we're doing. And we, we could just find them. some uh, industry that has lithium byproduct as a part of their manufacturing process uh, so they can make profit <laughs> off it, then maybe it'll be done. <laughs> That's it. We'll just use the system as it is. I like your thing. It's already in place. We're causing damage. Let's, let's have it. I like it. Um, um, so yeah, are you, we're are talking you, about doses of lithium. We're supplementing. So right. there's a big difference between right. natural medicine. Right. And so you're nutrition. using a low dose nutritional product. Okay. Yep. I call it a physiologic dose. So I explained there's pharmacologic doses, there's physiologic doses, right. and we're supporting the mechanisms that are already existing in your body. Right. Uh, resveratrol seems to have some potential benefit. That resveratrol is uh, an incredible nutrient that seems to have all sorts of potential benefits for yeah. longevity, yeah, right. for <laughs> cardiovascular disease, and for brain health. Right. Yeah, I mean, just potently potently antioxidant, really phenomenal nutrient that we go for, and, and it's food-based, right? So it's that's a really great one that you can say, you don't have to go out and buy this or have it in a supplement of sorts. And that education is really helpful. I have patients come in and again with all of these things lined up and they've got a bottle of, oh, I got this because of the resveratrol. I'm like, cool. You know, how about we do this from food? This, these are some delicious sources. Hey, do you drink red wine? <laughs> Great. What about dark chocolate and spices? I mean, you can't, you can't minimize the effect of spicing up our food. Us in our Western diet, man, the blandness of our food as a society is just, you know, sad in and of itself. Um, but you use some curcumin and clove and, you know, my favorite concoction here in my coffee is a teaspoon of cinnamon and clove and you get yourself a whole new ball game with with there how you, you go. Can. we have this loss of sense of smell which leads to a loss of sense of taste and so now we're spicing up our food in a way that's proving physiologic benefit and then increasing those taste receptors and oh my gosh right now now i'm salivating just talking about how do we taste how do we really engage with our food which then creates the digestive enzymes that we need in our stomach and stimulates the hydrochloric acid secretion so okay now we're breaking down our food for better absorption and bowel motility and but boom, right, here we go. <laughs> it's interesting, as you talk about loss of sense of smell and taste, and I think about the current viral situation we're in, and you wonder about the long-term uh, effects in potentially triggering uh, Parkinson's. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a huge risk factor. And I have these conversations with people that this is something that we need to prioritize getting back online, especially if I have some of these long-term patients who are like, hey, I got the... I got the OG COVID and I still can't smell. All right, well, we're going to have to work on that and, and really prioritize that. And if we can't get the smell back, how do we substitute that cephalic phase of digestion, right? That thinking about food, the smell that elicits the whole process to start. Um, how do we do that in different ways uh, in the body? And so mindfulness, gratitude, eating with community, harvesting your own food, cooking your own food. And then there is some smell retraining protocols that you can start working on as well. Um, but you can't substitute that phase of digestion, right? The, and, and we already know. And then we're talking memory. So you, when you talk to me, I go in all these directions because it matters. Now we're talking memory, right. Right. right? The smell trigger is one of the first things we do for our memory retrieval. And now that's gone. And oh, I, you know, I'm having some cognitive impairment. Well, is there a link there? Right. Absolutely. Um, 
So one final question. Um, I saw, and this is following up on the train of nutraceuticals, I saw ginkgo, vinpocetine, and I, both of these are, comp are products that are often seen in brain formulas, nootropics. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, nootropic brain formula? I do, I do. And, I, and of course it's anyway, so botanical medicine is, is the heart of my practice outside of everything that we've done in research to treat the individual. Um, you know, formulating a tincture for somebody with urinary urgency frequency, some nootropics, some cardiovascular support, some anti-diabetic, some anti-lipidemic, right? We can do these things with botanical medicine that helps the patient feel less like a pharmaceutical, you know, carrying case and more like they're in tune with their body. So I love those. My favorite nootropics, I mean, ginkgo's up there for sure. Um, but I studied under the, the great Dr. Eric Yarnell, who is the naturopathic herbalist of all herbalists and um, Bacopa and Go-To Cola are really two of my favorites, Centella. And then there's also Rosemary. Um, and so I'll tell people, you just, you can just do an essential oil and carry it around and sniff it as a nootropic huh. every time. And that actually stimulates, you know, blood flow to the brain. So there's some really phenomenal um, nootropic herbs out there. And ginkgo really is the most researched one. Um, now there's the environmental part of me that says we're also losing our ginkgo trees at a rapid rate. So there's, there's other resources that are just effective for, for cognitive impairment. And I brain see. Health. Interesting. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. So this has been a fascinating uh, podcast. Thank you so much. How can uh, viewers, listeners uh, find out more about you, get in contact with you? Uh, yeah. So I work at a practice called Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. I'm here in Northern Idaho, Coeur d'Alene. Um, and the contact info here is 208-664-1644 or info at cdahealingarts.com. Um, I do offer discovery calls, so free 15-minute consultations. If you just have some questions, concerns, I don't offer medical advice, but I can share some more education and insight um, and see if we can work together and, and always offer resources. So uh, patients and caregivers alike uh, can reach out for, for support. And what's your website? Uh, CDAhealingArts.com. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.